It's titled USB Device Analysis. It, this is not your typical forensic analysis. I am a kind of a more blue team uh, type of person. But this is not your typical walk through the registry, see what devices have been plugged into a system after you've detected this compromise. This is more uh, analyzing the device itself. Once you've identified a potentially weaponized USB device, how to figure out how it was weaponized and, and if it was weaponized. <clears throat> Before I get going here, how many of you guys are more towards the red team side? Okay, just a, just a few more. So the rest of you more towards the, the blue team side? In the defense, either proactive, reactive, uh, in, in some aspect or another? Great. Okay, so this, this is focused more on the, the defensive side, as, uh, as I described. Just a quick about me, I work for the Verizon Risk Team Consulting Agency. We do uh, cases for lots of different customers. This is based upon real life cases that I've personally run myself as well as a number of other people on my team. I can't discuss details of many of those as many of you are, are probably well aware. However, there are two scenarios in here that I can discuss and uh, we're, we're gonna go over them briefly. So first off, the agenda. <clears throat> I'm gonna tell you why this is a significant threat and why you need to be aware of this. <clears throat> And then we're going to go over the scenarios of how these attacks can take place. A couple, couple different things. Like I said, real life scenarios from, from the trenches of the Rise and Risk team. Uh, the types of attacks that can exist on these USB devices. Then I'm going to walk you through a methodology that's going to preserve, protect, and analyze the data on the device and the device itself. We want to do things in a specific order to make sure we don't destroy the potential for recovering the evidence, not necessarily for chain of custody concerns, things like that, but because we need to be able to analyze this evidence in order to properly assess the threat that we're addressing. After that, I'm gonna walk you through some tools. We're not gonna go into to typing commands or anything like that, but uh, many of the tools you're probably already familiar with, they're very well known. Then a little device and show and tell for those of you that maybe haven't seen what some of these devices look like that can uh, perform these USB attacks. And then a little discussion about the mitigation, how we can go about trying to prevent this or, or address this, this threat in our organizations. So to start off with, a study that was sponsored by DHS. The study was essentially throw out a bunch of thumb drives in a parking lot see who picks them up and plugs them into the computers. Big surprise, they got a good turnout. 60% <clears throat> of the drives that they plugged in, or sorry, 60% of the drives that they dropped got plugged in. They did a more specific study within, within that and they actually labeled many of those USB drives with a government agency logo of some sort. They didn't get specific on that, possibly DHS since DHS was involved there. 90% of the, the drives with a logo on it got plugged in. So just to go to show you here, the, the USB devices are an effective phishing type of technique. And those of you that are familiar with more of the social engineering aspect, right? Uh, David Kennedy was talking about that. Get your pretexting right and the rest of the job is, is fairly easy. So get the pretexting right on these devices and you're, you're pretty much guaranteed because guess what? Five years later, Google did a study uh, with, a, with a number of schools, colleges, and such. Almost the same result. You'd think we'd get down. This was in 2016, last year, right? And we're still having people pick up these devices. 48% of them plug these things in. It's, uh, it's a little baffling to me, the, the awareness that we've got with all these cyber attacks and the news and, and the sensitivity of all this kind of stuff. How people can still be this oblivious to basic security concerns. Well, that kind of falls on us, right? Get to the mitigation. Some of those drives were in minutes that they, they got picked up and plugged in on their way into work, sat down at their desk, forget the email, let's see what juicy photos we got on this th thumb drive here. <clears throat> you guys all heard of this little attack out in, in the middle of nowhere, maybe, called Stuxnet? Yeah, yeah. Uh, old one, right? 2010 is when it happened. 
you you've probably heard all kinds of stuff. There's a movie last is it last year 2015 about the the whole attack a semi documentary uh fairly interesting. It it dragged out in, in parts. I I watched it. In short, it was a thumb drive attack on the Iran nuclear program as we uh likely know. <clears throat> what you may also know is that the agency that sponsored this attack burned four zero days on it. That says something about that, right? That's the the investment, the the potential for income, the the burning of these zero days is, is not something that people take lightly when we're talking about these these type of actors. <clears throat> one of those exploits is significant because this is one of only just a, a, a few serious threats that you guys as blue teamers need to be extremely careful of. You know why? That link file exploit didn't require any interaction. All they had to do is plug the drive into the Windows system. It exploited the way that Windows interprets the icon that gets displayed as a part of the link file. So as soon as you get that drive in there, Windows is doing its helpful little thing, trying to figure out what all's on this drive, what do I need to prepare for this user, and give a good experience. That code was exploited by Stuxnet. That's how they got in there, and there was no interaction. Think about this in your context. You receive a thumb drive. You plug it into your forensic machine. Do you know if there's a weaponized file, a, a weaponized hardware in this thing at all? Not yet, right? The goal is to figure that out. But if you don't approach this in the right way, you're going to figure it out the hard way. So what I'm going to walk you through here in a few slides is a safe way to try and figure out how this thing is weaponized and then to, to preserve the data again so we can properly assess this threat. <clears throat> So now, vendor alert, I work for Verizon, I think I'd get fired if I didn't at least mention the data breach investigations report one time. So here's my, uh, my token DBIR slide. This is from the phishing chapter of the DBIR. You guys all familiar with the DBIR? Annual present, uh, excuse me, annual publication. There's another one coming out in, I think it's usually in end of March or, or beginning of April. Verizon compiles it, your guys' data is contributed to it. All of our competitors, a uh, number of large companies contribute their investigation data to it, and it allows, we have a, a team, I, I think there's like seven or eight people that are dedicated data scientist type of people to figuring things out like this. So there's a chapter on, on phishing, and this chart comes from the the attacks that are in this, this, in this investigation corpus, all security incidents and breaches combined together. The number one target, and you can see by quite a large margin, is credentials. What else is, what is this going after, uh, being going, gone after? Secrets, bank, medical, and personal. You're not that interesting. You as a person, Unfortunately, yeah, you're not that interesting to, to most attackers. However, your credentials into your network are very interesting. So, think about now you as a normal user on your network, not in investigation mode, but in your elevated privileges mode. You get this USB device, you plug it into your network, you've now given the potential to expose your credentials or tokens or what have you out to some uh, external threat actor or, or internal threat actor, really. Okay, uh, one, two, two more vendor alerts. Next slide. Another publication that we put out. This is this is where the real life scenario comes in. Data Breach Digest. It's a, a in the trenches stories and stuff. If you're interested in how investigations are performed by the risk team, there's there's a new one this year that was just released. So this comes from the 2017 version. <clears throat> it's a USB attack. It's a case that we handled for one of our customers. The scenario involved a janitor. He was offered money to take a USB device and go plug it in. For every day that he would go and plug it in, he'd get bonus money from this threat actor. <clears throat> so he did that, and for quite some time, uh, weeks if I recall correctly. There was no interaction involved with the USB. 
How is that possible? The Stuxnet link file exploit was patched by Microsoft quite a while back. Well, I'm going to walk you through some of those other exploits that can be, that can be done. On top of that, there's no USB enforcement, or no, no USB policy enforcement. The company had a policy that said you don't bring USB devices in, but no one cared. Yeah, someone's got that thumb drive, okay, whatever. Yeah, they, they, they must be doing good stuff with it. They, they know how to handle those things, right? Uh -huh. So a little quote for you. The activity would have remained, uh, let me give you a context a little. This is from the internal investigator of the company that we performed this investigation for. He, he gave us a, a number of uh, paragraphs as a, from his perspective in regards to this case. So this activity would have likely remained hidden for weeks or months had an eagle-eyed administrator not noticed an unexpected command shell pop up upon logging in. Detection, right? How do we detect these USB devices getting plugged in? Well, step one, you got to figure out what, what is that USB device that's getting plugged in. Step two is to try and figure out how you can recognize that so you can build detection, right? That's, that's how we build our, our responses and, and uh, reactions. This scenario is a different company. It was from our last year's Data Breach Digest uh, publication. This infection, again, USB, we handled it. It was a, uh, an unexpected USB drive was delivered to a high-level executive who had just attended a conference and visited a booth for a fictitious company that was crafted specifically for this attack. Very, very involved. I'm not going to use the word advanced, but uh, very involved, very, very, uh, very lengthy in the setup for this attack. <clears throat> They had targeted this guy because they knew he had high-level privileges in the company, all that kind of stuff. They used branding on the thumb drive, pretext, right? They included a letterhead to try and legitimize this, this marketing packet that was be being delivered to the guy who just attended a conference, who just spoke with some people in a booth at that conference. Build up, right? Okay, so again... <clears throat> Here's a quote. This is from, from uh, I forget who wrote this, but uh, it's someone in Verizon anyways. Once the reverse shell had been established, it didn't take long for the threat actor to start exfiltrating gigabytes of data, including an unreleased movie. This was a interpreter reverse shell that, uh, that came out of this case. Doesn't take a whole lot. You guys saw it on Mr. Robot, right? Social engineering toolkit to, to build up that USB. He goes and plugs it in and, and done. Okay, vendor alert's over. We're, we're out of that. <clears throat> the types of attacks. First type of attack, I put them in two categories. The first type is file-based. You're probably well aware of these. Everyone knows PDFs can have exploits. PDFs can have weaponized code in them. They can have JavaScript. They can have ActionScript. They can be triggered or they can be activated by user interaction of buttons or links, things like that. Excel docs, Word docs... I've seen some talk about the publisher documents coming around more recently too. Any of those office files going back to the, to the 1990s and using macros, right? We've got a, an incredible amount of ability to enable our users to just destroy our network with automation of, of this code, and the attackers are taking advantage of that. And then the last one, this, it's kind of dead by now, but uh, the link files, they've, they've patched it. It was a vulnerability in XP, it's, it's patched as long as you've patched up your, your XP installs. <laughs> uh, you, you'll be all right. If you're running Windows 7, it doesn't have that. Not to say that one of these couldn't be revealed again in the future, right? Maybe in the, uh, the Vault 7 link that just came out. Yes? <laughs> A link file exploit? Aha, lovely. <clears throat> so beware of that with your forensic machines because you don't want to get that compromised. Physical attacks. This is what some of the, the blue team side doesn't take as much consideration on. But the probably most well-known device in this space, because it's been around for the longest, is the Hack 5 USB rubber ducky. Any of you guys own one of those? How many own like 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10? Yeah. <laughs> Drop those in the parking lot? Mm-mm, not too expensive. 
So the, the physical attacks involve what's, what's uh, abbreviated in the operating system as an HID, human interface device. That's anything that we as people touch. That's the keyboard, that's the mouse, it could be a tablet, drawing, any of those are human interface devices. Think about when you have a laptop, you plug one of those keyboards in or a mouse. Do you have to type in a password? No, they're plug and play devices. That's how they've been designed. Again, Windows trying to make things easy. When you plug that keyboard in, it has the same authority that you do. So imagine a keyboard that's got a stuck key on it and you plug it in, right? What's going to happen? Across your screen. Imagine a keyboard that's got a, a little mini controller that can start typing commands at will. That's the rubber ducky. So you plug one of these devices into the wrong machine, you're going to give it control over your entire network. It can even reach out to external uh, C2 servers and, and report things. The, the rubber ducky has the ability to script. You can write up the script, compile it, program it into the device, and it's weaponized that easy. You can also have USB CD-ROM attacks. Windows 7, maybe Vista, but no one cares about that. 7 disabled USB auto run, right? Has anyone tried to enable USB auto run on 7? I have. I can't figure out a way. You, as far as I know, you can't do it. So having a mass storage USB auto run is not going to work. However, a CD-ROM is still allowed to auto run by Windows. There are many USB devices that can emulate a CD-ROM. You used to have those thumb drives, the uh, U3, and uh, I think there's a couple other competitors that, that had similar things where you plug it in and it had the portable apps that would pop up in the bottom corner of your computer. Uh, it also had encryption built in, so it would spin up a little password box. You could type that in. It would interact with the chip. That was through the auto run emulating a CD-ROM in the computer so it could get something running. So we could, you could use a device, the, the rubber ducky is not specifically capable of that, but there are a number of other devices that are capable of emulating these CD-ROMs. You put the right executable on there and it's going to pop and under the same privileges that you are currently running. <clears throat> and then last, the USB Ethernet adapter. This was made popular by, most recently, the Poison Tap from uh, Sammy, I'm forgetting his last name. Uh, then before that, it was uh, Mubix, right? Uh, and I'm blanking on his name right now, too. But uh, they came across some attacks where these USB devices could emulate an Ethernet card. The rubber ducky isn't quite capable of that. Capable of that. It's not quite got the power to do that, but there are additional devices called USB Armory and then another one called the uh, Hack 5 Turtle. I'm sorry? One more time. Land turtle. Okay. Thank you. So these are uh, essentially mini computers that you can do more programming on and they can do a whole lot more. This USB Ethernet adapter, again, does not require any privileges. You don't have to type a password. There's no driver to install. The driver is already there. It's a plug and play device. The threat with the Ethernet adapter, if you're not familiar, you can, you can go into the details of uh, PoisonTap. You uh, do a Google search for USB PoisonTap. There's a number of blog articles that, that explain full details about how it works. But in a nutshell, it inserts a USB Ethernet card, which looks very much like an Ethernet card. It establishes itself as a super high-speed Ethernet card which then tells the operating, well, the operating system then places it at a higher priority and sends all of its traffic out on that device, even though there's nothing else plugged in on it. But what the device does is it turns it around and puts it out on the lower priority device, and in the meantime, <laughs> taking up all the data that's coming through there, right? So it's a, it's a very dangerous attack, and the poison tap specifically is able to actually, as your web traffic goes through. He is able to inject malicious JavaScript into the, I think it's the Alexa's top million sites. So basically, if you're on the internet at all while this thing is plugged in, he injects a JavaScript piece of code that remains malicious. He sets the cache settings so that it doesn't expire. The only way to get rid of your backdoor 
is to clear out your browser cache. As long as that browser is running, he's got a backdoor in your machine through this poison tap. It's, it's a very serious attack, and it doesn't have to have an unlocked computer. It works on the lock screen of, of Mac, Windows, and I think Linux. Confirmation? Yeah. So it's, it's a serious, serious attack. It requires physical access, so it's a little bit more of an advanced attack. However, it is a, a real, real attack. Okay, so the methodology that I'm uh, explaining to you here at a, at a high level, we want to collect the image from the USDB device if there's an image to collect. If it's a storage type of USB, if it presents any type of storage, we want to get the image off of there because there could be file-based weaponized uh, PDF, Word docs, things like that. The reason for that is because some of these things with the scripting, they could try to execute and then wipe their contents. So we want to get the contents of that disk before the, the script has a chance to, to execute and, and do anything with the contents of the storage. The next part is you want to prepare a, a, a throwaway machine and you want to essentially try to infect that machine. And then you're going to collect all the volatile data from that machine and analyze it just like you would any other machine with, uh, with suspecting malware activity on it. Only we've got the benefit of having a clean, well, clean image and then an after post-infection image and we can do a comparison and try to get to the, the conclusion a little faster. If there are files in the storage, PDF, Word docs, things like that, we want to analyze those files with the tools that, that are appropriate for each type of file. If, uh, if there's volatile data from our, from our collection, we want to do some diffs and, and try to identify are there new processes that have been created, are there any files that have been dropped, any reg, file, uh, reg keys that have been created, things like that. And then, you like that last one, collect the firmware? Yeah. So depending on the device, it's easier than, uh, some devices are easier than others. There is a capability, and I'll show you, I, I got a slide at the end with, with a picture of the chip, because why not? There's the ability to program some of the commodity cheap USB drive that you can buy from Amazon in, in bulk for a couple dollars a piece. You can reprogram those to be weaponized USB devices. And there's tools out there that do that. In fact, there is a converter out there that you can write a rubber ducky script and it will compile it into the, the firmware for this Fison brand controller, P-H-I-S-O-N. And it will then program that firmware onto the device and turn it essentially into a rubber ducky. It's fairly easy to do now. So the details of each step. On the first step for collecting the image, you need a physical machine. You can't do this with a virtual. Have any of you tried to do stuff like this with a, with a virtual? The VMware, the, those, uh, the hypervisors, they monitor. I've, I've got a Mac. I use Fusion. It monitors for mass storage devices. It does not monitor for other things, not all other things. If you've got a phone, then it, it might put it over there, you know, things like that. So you need a physical device. You need a physical machine. And my recommendation uh, is to use a... Linux forensic boot CD, so you don't have to worry about Windows getting infected. You don't have to, to worry about that disk being damaged, uh, in, infected in any way. You got a boot CD, you, you reboot, and, and it's clear. The reason why we use Linux is because it's typically a less targeted operating system, right? But the key to this is using a hardware USB write blocker. Anyone know why? Okay, yeah, great. It's, the purpose of it is to prevent all those write-backs, yes. But what I haven't heard yet is it works like a firewall. Think about this. The, the device there, I've got one in, in the bag here too. It is designed to prevent write-backs to storage, right? It only recognizes storage devices. If you plug a mouse in, through that Weeby Tech or a Tableau write blocker that's designed for USB devices, your mouse no worky. It doesn't pass through HID devices. So if the HID device can't get passed through, it can't interact with the system. We use a hardware write blocker 
to prevent all that interaction. We only allow the data to pass through. We're able to collect the image. That way, if the script is, is self-destructing of any kind, it can't do anything. The script is not running because the write blocker prevents it from running. Make sense? They're also cheap. You can buy, well, relatively cheap, let me say that. You can buy them, I, I think that guy right there is, is about like 40 bucks, maybe, something like that. Uh, what, that one? The Weeby Tech? Oh man, they're, uh, they're proud of that device now. <clears throat> Tableau has one that's, that's also right around that area, like $100, $200, something like that. But think about this, if you get one of those USB devices that has a capacitor built into it that stores up the charge and then boom, blows up your computer, would you rather blow up a $150 write blocker or would you rather blow up your $4,000 MacBook Pro? I think the, the question's pretty clear or the answer's pretty clear there, right? I mean, if you got unlimited budget and you like fireworks, then... <laughs> well, fair point. <laughs> Blow up the MacBooks then. <laughs> okay, so the last thing is use, use whatever uh, tool that you want to do to extract the data off of their DD, uh, any of the flavors of, of DD to, to make a disk image. Doesn't matter at that point. The key is the hardware write blocker, really. The Linux is more of a suggestion because you can just reboot and everything's gone. Next step is collecting the volatile data. This one's a little longer. You need to have a physical machine again because we're trying to get those HIDs, we're trying to get the USB Ethernet, anything else that's going on with this device. Then we want a Windows OS because typically that's what's exploited, right? So we want to go with the larger, larger footprint. Here's a tip. Wipe your drive with zeros. Don't do one of those 37 pass random junk things because you're going to be acquiring this disk and you're going to be storing it in DD or E01 or what have you. So wipe it with zeros so it compresses really well. You know everything that's written on there is just the data that you've put. <clears throat> on top of that, don't use a terabyte drive. Again, just little tips that, uh, that we've learned along the way. Use the smallest drive you can. With, if you're using XP, then you could get away with a a tiny little 64 gig SSD or, or something like that. But uh, yeah, go small and, and do all that. Step three, software write blocker in this case. You can use, there's a registry, I call it a, a hack, but that, that might incite some rage in, in some people. Uh, there's a registry key that allows Windows to, to manage the write blocks. You can do that, it's free. It's a reg, .reg file you can just upload into your reg, reg hive. The uh, NCASE product has a built-in write blocker. It works without the dongle, so you can use that if you, if you have NCASE. Uh, there's a number of other products out there with software write blockers, so find, find one and, and use it. Yeah, question? The statement was that that reg key hack only works in XP and the question is has that changed it, or does it work in Windows 7 and my answer is I, I don't have a clue because I don't like that hack personally. I'd rather use a, a tool that's, that's a little more robust like NCASE or, or one of these others. Uh, NCASE is still my primary tool for accessing file systems in, in images so uh, that's, that's what I usually go with on that. <clears throat> Does anyone have a response to, to that comment question? A group of keys, and that makes it effective on 7 and 10? Okay. You hear. Okay. So, alleged hearsay. Take that for what it's worth. Yes. <laughs> uh, so, collect an image before you do all the dirty work. <clears throat> you want to make sure you get that, that before image. Do... Uh, do a prep of any of your volatile tools, whatever it is that you like to use when you're monitoring. If you've got a malware sandbox setup that you like to use, whether it's sys internal tools, if you want to do a cuckoo setup on a physical machine, is that possible? I've not actually tried that. Uh, but anyways, whatever it is that you want to do to collect all that data, prepare it. Get it all ready to go. Step six, I've got a PowerShell that's going to make your life a little bit easier when it comes to analyzing specifically these USB devices. It is a very simple PowerShell. I've got a link to, it's up on GitHub as a, as a gist. So you can grab that. It's, it's very simple, very effective 
in detecting the, the hardware-based attacks on these USB devices. Once all of that is ready, the PowerShell will, will start and it'll pause. So it'll say, okay, insert the drive. Once you've got all that prepped, you insert the drive and you kick back for a minute, go get a cup of coffee, something like that. You let it have time to do its dirty work. You come back, you kill the PowerShell, you kill your volatile collection tools, you power it all down, you collect your image, and you've now prepared yourself for a differential analysis of this system. Uh, that's the last of it. <clears throat> so uh, getting into the in analyzing of the file contents, the, the weaponized files or the existence of. Do you guys use automated AV scans? If you don't, do it. I know we all make fun of the AV industry and how horrible they are and how don't, they don't detect things and all that kind of stuff, but uh, it's, it's low-hanging fruit. If it can detect it, I mean, for, for uh, a minute of double-clicking on the batch file that can kick off a, a multitude of these AV scans, why not? Let it go for an hour uh, if, it's, if it's that large, and you come back and re review the results. If you track IOCs, previous IOCs with your case, or if you've got threat intel feeds that have IOCs for certain types of attacks, file hashes, anything like that, run those through, through all those files. Again, automated things, you get a high return on your investment of time. I've learned that in my consulting side of this career because customers don't want to pay me to look through every single byte and the price that Verizon charges. So got to be uh, more efficient with your, with your time. <clears throat> and it can extend to, to those of you that are in-house investigators too. And then lastly, file format specific tools. This is where your time gets sunk in. You're using the tools. I've got the list of tools in a couple slides. Your uh, Didier Stevens tools, the uh, Desilage, his Olay tools, things like that to, to manually analyze and inspect the contents to see how these files are sitting as far as being weaponized. <clears throat> Go look at the uh, analyze volatile data. This is, this is the order that I put it in because I find it most efficient. Look at the file contents first. That's the easier attack to, to set up your, your uh, what is it? set does that too, right? In, in Cali, I'm, I'm not real strong on the red team side, but set is a tool that'll build like a weaponized PDF or was there another tool in Cali that does that? Yeah, set, social. Say one. Magic Unicorn, I haven't even heard of that one. All right, well, pick your tool. It's, it's easy to build one of these weaponized file-based attacks. It's a little more difficult to build one of these hardware-based attacks. It's a, it's a little more money, things like that. It's, it's a bit more of an obstacle, so hit the easy stuff first. So for the analyzing volatile data, you've got your disk images. Do a compare. Use some sort of file diffing tool, WinMerge, KDIF3, any of these beyond compare. You can dump file listings and do comparisons of each other and get a, a real quick result out of that. Collect your RAM images and you can do volatility dumps and do again a diff between them and find those differences really quickly. And then re review the contents of the output from the PowerShell that you also ran because this is going to make it really easy. I'll show you some screenshots in, in just a second. And then whatever it is you, that you do that finds evil, whatever your, your process is, just go look for evil at that point because you're dealing with a potentially infected machine. However you determine if a machine is infected, do it. Lastly, this is only a step that's necessary if, if you think that you are that valuable of a target that there is... This, uh, this specialized kind of hardware. It's not a, a trivial thing to do, but it, it is doable. Uh, and that is to get into the device itself. There's a tool that called Chip Easy. I've got that on there. It's po very potentially actually a, a weaponized file itself, depending on what .ru site you do download it from. I've got the link of where I believe is a safe one, but again, be cautious. It's a, it's a Chinese-based website, and you can use your Google Translate to, to read some of those messages. Chip Easy, I'll show you a screen of it, identifies the controller that's inside there. It tells you the version of the firmware. It also goes as far as trying to suggest to you what utility, again, from that Chinese website that you can use to dump the firmware, and then it's up to you to analyze using IDA or, or any other tools that, that you want to get into to doing that with. <clears throat> and have fun reverse engineering, right? That's, that's the fun part. 
Any of you do that? Reverse engineering firmware? Yeah, all right. Got Buddy back there to, to make friends with. Beers tonight, I think you got a, a whole lineup coming to you. Okay, so some of the tools. Any questions on, on the methodology? Pretty logical, right? It's just making sure that you account for that. This has been built because of, like I said, many, many cases that we've handled, some mistakes that we've made, we've learned from, and we've, we've kind of, I don't want to say perfected, but we've refined this process, this methodology, to make sure that we don't miss any of these things when we're doing uh, analysis of these devices. So the tools, like I said, Didier Stevens, he's got a, a whole bunch of them, and, and he's added a few. Question? Yeah. Yes, the, I've got, does, does this group post slides? Do you, do you host the slides or not? No? Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll put them up and, and I can send a tweet. Uh, I've got a previous version. It's, it's a little less slides in here that I gave at B-Sides in LA. Uh, that's, that's already up, but uh, I'll, I'll put up this version. Yeah, happy to provide that because there are a bunch of URLs ac across the bottoms of all of these so you can have reference. Absolutely. So the Didier Stevens suite, the P PDF, or P P PDF, I don't even know how to pronounce that properly, but I, I love the tool. I just don't know how to say it. <clears throat> uh, I like each of Didier's and, and P P P P that, the second one because they each have their strengths. Some of them, the, the P P T D F P P the second one, <laughs> has some automated kind of uh, scanning for some of the event-driven actions that happen. The Didier's tools are a little bit more towards the manual analysis, but he does give some statistical analysis trying to identify what type of objects and, and what keywords are in there. So I recommend both tools, exploring both. Uh, there's a great blog that Didier runs that explains a whole lot about how to use his tools. Great, great resource there. For the Word uh, or Office-based files, the Desilage tools are my favorite. He, he almost primarily or almost uh, uh, exclusively, I, I use the Desilage tools. He's just constantly updating these and, and doing some some great work with it. So any of those uh, Olay-based files, the previous version, the Doc uh, XLS files, including the newer Zip archive format of the Word, uh, the DocX, the XLSX, those, those series as well. He handles all of those. He's got a ton of automated things in there, including a number of decoding routines and decryption routines for the various campaigns that have gone around as they've been reverse engineered. So he's, he's got some really good stuff in that tool. If you haven't used it, definitely. Although I need to update that because he's moved over to GitHub. He, the Bitbucket is still up, but he's moved over to GitHub. So make sure you get it from GitHub rather than the Bitbucket. Didier has some, some Olay tools as well, but uh, I think I've seen Didier even kind of relax on some of his Olay stuff because Desilage has such a, gr a great tool over there. <clears throat> so here's a picture of that chip easy. You can see the output that comes out. It gets, gets you the controller information, the firmware information. It even goes into the volume size, things like that. You can see if the device has been over, uh, over allocated. There's some of those cheaper USB devices that they allocate them for 16 gigs, even though there's only four gig of chip inside of there. So this chip easy can be used for that too. But it will identify the controller and it will identify the firmware. I'm only aware of Phison, P-H-I-S-O-N, being vulnerable to reprogramming. That's not to say that the others can't. That's the only one that I'm aware of currently is the, the Fizon controllers. It's not an exploit. It's not a bug that Fizon is going to fix. It is a capability for companies like SanDisk to buy chips from Fizon as their controllers, and it's the ability for them to program that to be a U3 device with a CD-ROM or to be something with a HID device or something along those lines. It's field programmable. Some of the other companies make it a write-once type of firmware that you can only program it to be that, that functionality once and it remains there. Fizon, you can, you can update it as long as you've got the right firmware tools and everything. So chip easy, get it from that, that upan.cc because that's, that's the one that I've... Uh, seems that it's the most legit site anyways for, for this tool. I still run it in a VM. 
my PowerShell is up on as a gist on uh, on GitHub, so you can grab that. It's ridiculously simple. The functionality of the PowerShell is about three lines. The process of the PowerShell is you start it up before plugging the USB in. It grabs a list of all the plug and play devices. Just a big long collection list. You then insert it, you let it do all of its stuff, and then you hit enter. Once it's done, it goes back and gets another list of all those PNP devices. And there's a command in PowerShell that says, give me the difference. That's it. Collect, collect, give me the difference. The thing's like 30 lines of code because of prettiness. Right? That's, that's how it works with programming. So it really is not all that complicated. It's not amazing. It's nothing, but it's very effective in identifying these devices. And here's why. The output here is run against one of these uh, well, is, no, is this the... So the first thing at the top, I know this is kind of small for you guys to read. The first thing out there is identified as a USB store. The next device is identified as a storage volume. The next one is just a plain USB, as typical of, of a storage. You get a USB store and a USB. And then you get the WPD bus enum root, which again is typical of USB storage. Are we looking at a weaponized, hardware weaponized USB, or are we looking at a thumb drive, standard thumb drive? This is a standard thumb drive, just run of the mill, any storage, whatever it is. So that top part of the output is a summary view just to give you that, that quick list of the devices. You can see there the vid and PID numbers in there. Below that is a full dump of every property that PowerShell has access to for every single one of those devices. Currently, you gotta copy paste and make it a, a text file. Eventually, I'll get around to having it output automatically to a text file. It's not that hard. It's, it'll add like one more line to PowerShell, but that's how lazy I am apparently. So the next device is uh, at the top, USB vid PID. Uh, the next one is HID vid PID. Mm. Eyebrows raising there. This was the rubber ducky, if I remember correctly, the output from the rubber ducky. So it can present storage in this case. I did not present storage. It only does the HID device, and I think this is the, the script that opens the start run, types notepad, and then types hello world. I've got it in my bag if anyone wants to try me. No? No takers? So that's, that's what that looks like with an HID, no storage. <clears throat> this one has uh, one device. Just moved a little bit, is that better? This has one device and it is a USB vid PID in the summary. It's not real easy to tell in the summary, but does anyone spot the, uh, the fairly scary looking thing in the details? I love the name of this, by the way. Down here, can't point to my computer screen, but right, where'd it go? Right here. R-N-D-I-S, Ethernet Gadget. That is the poison tap. That's it, no storage, no HID, just the Ethernet. That's what the, that's what the poison tap looks like. So some more output. This is, again, the rubber ducky. It presents all of these things. You wanna test your tools ahead of time so you know what's good, what's bad, right? Whitelist, blacklist type of thing. Know, be aware of what uh, your systems are doing. So this is the rubber ducky output. Again, we've got mass storage, we've got input, we've got keyboard, we've got generic volume, we've got ducky storage. I mean, you can't get more blatant than that, right? This is, this is a, very blatant configuration of the ducky. <clears throat> this is the, the Hack 5, the, the land turtle. Was The correction was that? Land turtle, okay. So the Hack 5 land turtle, it's a uh, USB Ethernet device looking thing, funny enough, uh, but it's got a little computer in it. So you can actually program it to do more things and this does that elevated Ethernet so it loops back out to the actual thing and slurps up all your traffic. That's what you get. You get an ISATAP adapter and you get a Realtek controller. 
This is the USB armory with the uh, with the Ethernet attack. This is not poison tap, although the armory can run the poison tap. The poison tap output that I had previously just came to me was run on the Raspberry Pi Zero, if I'm remembering correctly, like the five dollar one, super super cheap. So yeah, again scary. <clears throat> This is the armory, which I believe is closer to like $100, maybe, maybe a little more. Uh, involves a little more cost and, and setup, but it has an ARM controller, an ARM processor in it, and can do a whole lot more. It can actually slurp up and, and store credentials and stuff on that drive, so you can just, in a pen test, go in, plug in, sit there for a minute while the secretary is looking you up. Oh, no, you're not on the list to, to be approved. Okay, all right, thanks. Out you go with your drive, right? So you get a, a RNDIS gadget again, and you get the Isotap adapter. That's, that's all they need for the high elevated privilege uh, USB Ethernet. So questions on any of those devices? Any guys need new, uh, new underwear yet? Okay then, a uh, little device and show it to, uh, any questions on anything else? The Bash Bunny, I have not, no. If you have one, though, I'd be happy to collect the results of, of the PowerShell to see what it looks like. Yeah, the, the Raspberry Pi Poison Tap was uh, one of the Carbon Black uh, sales guys was uh, at an ISSA meeting, and he's like, yeah, I got one of those. He's like, okay, run my script and give me the output. So he gave me the output. So yeah, if, if, uh, if you've got any other devices and, and you run this, I'd be happy to include this in, in the slides for, for displaying to, to others. A Leonardo Arduino, does it, it's similar to the Raspberry Pi. Oh, the rubber ducky, ducky type of thing. So not quite to the Ethernet, but, but with the scripting of the HID and things. Okay, good to know. I've not observed that. Not to say that we've missed it. I, I've not actually looked for that. But uh, have you? <laughs> well, uh, as far as I understand, as long as the device is created properly, I, I used to work for Guidance, uh, familiar with Tableau. They only program from the privileged side of the blocker. So you shouldn't be able to reprogram the, the firmware on the Tableau from the, the uh, dangerous side. True. I know I, I have a combo, uh, Weeby Tech combo dock, and the firmware is only updatable from the privileged side as well. I can't speak to the rest of the, the Weeby Techs, but I do know for those two devices, you can only do it from the privileged side. I am, would imagine that it's true, but I'm not going to speak to that because we all know bugs can happen in code and who knows what happens after that. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, well, uh, what was it? Uh, like eight, nine, ten months ago, something like that, there was an exploit that was developed for the outside-in plugin. Maybe it was a little longer. My time might have passed a little more. Outside-in plugin developed by Oracle that pretty much every forensic platform tool uses. Your Xways, your NCase, your FTK, uh, Nuix, they all use this outside-in plugin. And there was an exploit developed for a certain crafted file that would actually execute code on forensic machines, essentially. It was kind of a controlled scenario, but you know, it, it, it was still out there. So yeah, very, very curious kind of setup, but I suspect that it would probably not be very effective unless there was some sort of uh, mistake in the code bug kind of thing. Question? Okay. No, I the what was it called? The net net hunter, 
Okay, so there's a tool on, on Cali called NetHunter. I'm not a red team So an Android tablet or phone or something like that, and it turns that into one of these things. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I'm not a red team guy. I'm, I'm blue team defense reactionary, more specifically, not proactive even. Uh, so, no, I've not played around with that. But it's that's an interesting concept. I love it. Very fascinated about the the attacking side, but uh, but yeah, it doesn't pay my bills. <laughs> I'd be horrible at it. Yeah. I, no, I'm not plugging that in. <laughs> so fitting though, right? I, I opened up the bags like, oh man. <laughs> Has anyone if seen any weird mouse movements on their, on their screen anywhere? If Ryzen sponsored the conference and provided those USB drives? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but yeah, speaking of, any other questions? Okay, speaking of devices, have you guys seen any of these things? in vendor marketing materials. The first one that I saw was American Express, and it was an HID device. It opened up your start run, and it started typing out HTTP, because there wasn't any S at the time, at least for most sites, colon slash slash AmericanExpress.com, and it would pop up your default browser on their website. Oh, I. I have a few of them at home because I saw that. I was like, yeah, I need some of those. <clears throat> I, I think I heard that they're reprogrammable at one point, but now you don't need it because you get the rubber duckies and such. But yeah, the, this, is, this was years and years ago. I, I can't put a year to it, but I, I know it was quite a long time ago. People knew about this. They, they were exploiting it for their, for their vendor marketing kind of advantages to bring it up because they know, oh, you're not going to plug in storage and double click on this file here and there. And so, well, well, if we just force them to do it. There are some of these that are storage, so not all of those card flip-out things are, are HID. In fact, I've not seen as many HIDs lately. So, But that's, that's one that was fun. So for those of you that haven't seen, this is Rubber Ducky. The insides of it. It comes with a case that actually looks exactly like the conference thumb drive. If you were to take that, that printed part of it off of the conference thumb drive and put it on the Rubber Ducky case, yeah, suckers. <clears throat> So the, the micro SD card is how you put the, the scripts on there. You just load it up and it does one at a time. You can only have one be the script, so you can't like load it up with a whole bunch and pick at runtime what you want to do. It's it's whatever you've programmed it to be. So you gotta have a keychain of multiples that, that you get to, to pick which. This is the USB armory. It's a little bulkier in size, it's a little harder to mask and, and convince someone that it's a normal USB unless you were to, to make it like one of those lacy baton USB drives. You guys seen those things? Weapons. But uh, it's, it's a little bigger. It requires a little more power, stuff like that. But yeah, that's what it looks like. And there's a picture of the Fizon controller. If you tear the device apart, that's, that's what you'll see. I, I don't think there's a specific model that's vulnerable. It's, uh, it's the Fizon in general. Like I said, not a bug, not an exploit. It's a feature. Yeah, exactly. Working as intended, yeah. So you can configure it to be a CD, an HID, a storage, or any combination of those three. Crazy. Oops, last one. Mitigation. Number one, humans are weak, right? We, we know that very well. We need to educate our users and make sure that they are aware. The, the gross majority of the cases, the USB cases that the Verizon group has handled have been because the user identified something weird about this device came in and I'm not going to plug it in. Yeah, the, uh, the other cases where we investigate an infection and it might have come from a USB, that, that USB is long gone because the user doesn't want to admit to doing any of this stuff. So the, the cases that we've done where it's been specifically for USB, it's because the user was aware, they were educated properly, they knew about the security concerns, and they identified this and took it to their, their uh, InfoSec team for investigation. So uh, make, sure, make sure your users are, are aware. Include this in your training if you're not already uh, getting, them, getting them on that. Data loss prevention tools. 
Some of them have the capability to, to lock down or at least monitor ports, what's being plugged in and, and unplugged, things like that. So there's, there's a ton of these things. There used to be more specifically USB or, or port focused tools that could be centrally managed and, and have policies. I'm, I'm, I tried to remember the one that, that I've worked with previously, but it was specifically ports and it would even integrate with the encryption on certain USB vendors, the, the enterprise level uh, USB devices that have the built-in encryption chips so that you could program network keys onto the device that if an employee unplugs the, the encrypted thumb drive and went home to plug in, it wouldn't work because it couldn't get the network-based keys on top of their user-based keys. So it's data loss prevention in a sort, but it, it was specifically for these ports and USB devices. Uh, but, but more and more data loss prevention tools are including these, these type of policies. So this, this is something you just, you got to make it reasonable, right? If you lock it down too much, users are going to bypass and, and they're not going to report things. So there, there's a balance in the middle. And then last, the, the blog post here was posted just, I want to say last week maybe. It's, it's a pretty fresh one. And it's, it's the, the Twitter account passing the hash. I don't know the guy, but he put up a blog post about how to mitigate the poison tap and the, uh, the USB armory, the, the ethernet based attacks that are doing that highly elevated ethernet and then turning around, capturing the, and, and poisoning the cache, all that kind of stuff. The, the gist behind this is it's a group policy that blocks the association that the drivers are already there remember plug and play devices it blocks the association of new devices to these drivers and there's a very specific driver class that he talks about on there it's got the GUID included and there's one point that he's got in big bold letters there's a checkbox that says apply only to new devices or apply to all devices Guess which one's going to make a big headache for you if you choose the wrong value? Yeah. If you do that, your network devices across your entire enterprise will go and you won't have a lot of angry users that won't be able to connect. Although it would reduce on the email flow. So yeah. give and take, right? <clears throat> so there's a policy that you can apply and that, that will take, should, let me say, should take care of the the ethernet based attack on these new devices that are getting inserted. He's not fully vetted. He, he kind of makes a request to, to get feedback from, from guys that have tested it uh, to, to ensure that that is good advice on the policy that he's designed. But that's, that's the best mitigation as far as the, the ethernet based attacks. As far as the keyboard attacks and the, the HID, the mouse and keyboard, education, that's, that's the best I got. You can't block laptop users from plugging in a mouse, right? You'd, you'd infuriate these users if they couldn't plug in their mouse or, or external keyboards or docking stations, things like that. So if your DLP has the capability to get granular for specific devices, even to the point of serial numbers, maybe, but otherwise you're going to have to rely on user education and them being the detection mechanism for some of these devices. Because I'm not aware of any event logs, uh, event IDs, that indicate a mouse or a keyboard has been plugged in. So if you're in a hunting role, you might be able to get into the, uh, what's the current version, the setup dev API log thing on disk, where it logs all of the USB plug and play devices. You might be able to hunt those logs, pull those back periodically and see what, what's been plugged in. But uh, other than that, it's, it's a kind of a dangerous, dangerous area to be in. So any questions on the mitigation? No, thought I saw a hand. It was a head scratch. <clears throat> All right. Was that like a fake? Like, no. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, thanks for enduring my, uh, my blabbering, and I hope you got something useful out of this. And please, I'm, I'm very open to feedback. If you've got devices, the, the Android devices, if you want to run the PowerShell, I'll throw it up here. I, I've been asked to give this talk a, a number of times because the, the threat of this is very real. I had a CISO in my area who said, it's not often that people can scare me about these threats. He's usually the one doing the, the, the scaring. It's, it's a serious threat. So take it seriously, take the right approach, and we can 
uh, address this in, in a good way. So thanks again.